Well, Pemberton Chartered ACCA Accountant join us, joins us rather to continue the discussion. Good morning, Mr. Pemberton, and welcome. Hi, good morning, and thank you for having me on your show. It's a pleasure to have you with us this morning. Thank you for getting up so early to chat with us and get straight into the conversation. Um, this morning, we're going to be focusing a bit, of course, on the energy sector, a keen area of attention um, that many, of course, look to every single year. Um, in what you've experienced so far in your um, profession, what do you see as some of the recent mega trends in the energy sector? Um, and everyone talks about the energy transition, uh, which is a hot topic, um, a hot global topic. But I believe some folks don't really look at the macro perspective of how energy is consumed, meaning 90% of our energy resources still come from fossil fuels. Um, coal accounts for about 34%, uh, oil another 30 and natural gas another 30 Renewables account for about 10% of the global energy use. And out of those renewables, hydroelectric consume about 4%. So when you talk about solar and wind, only about 6% of the global energy landscape uses that energy. So I think we need to put that in context in the energy transition, and it will take a while before we wean off fossil fuels. As that impacts Trinidad, Trinidad still has some key advantages globally that are underestimated. One is we have infrastructure, which is a key, key element to, 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 to delivering value to the rest of the world. Um, and we need to leverage on that infrastructure, which we could talk on about later. Um, secondly, we have skilled labor, which is also a key ingredient for producing and delivering um, energy for the rest of the world. And to some extent, we have capital. Um, however, local or local investors don't necessarily invest in the local energy sector, which needs to change as well. So Trinidad, at a high level, the, the, energy, the, the global energy landscape is changing. Trinidad is well poised to participate in that, but the model they used in the past needs to be transformed. What recommendations would you have for transformation of that model, Mr. Pemberton? Well, we all know that the decline in natural gas is, is happening um, within our shores. We also know that Venezuela is key to delivering natural gas for the long-term sustainability of the sector, together with deep water gas. Um, Venezuela has its geopolitical challenges, um, most of which we do not have control over. For example, U.S. elections, the impact that may or may not have, um, the Venezuelan government, their posturing and so on. Um, we don't know and we don't have any control over that. The deep water gas discovery is quite, quite encouraging, but the cost of landing that gas on short not is quite expensive, so we have to be competitive. So as I said earlier, what we do have is infrastructure, the transmission I'm, I'm, I'm articulating is that how do you utilize that infrastructure differently? So for example, bunkering and trading is an extremely lucrative business. We have significant assets, we have ports, we have storage, uh, but we do have some intellectual capital in that area, which needs to be expanded, which we could, we should be expanding for bunkering all fuels. So put another way, making sure not into very big gas stations to fuel methanol for ships, LNG bunkering, um, ammonia bunkering, jet fuel, etc. So that's one major part of the transmission I expect. The other part is how gas is allocated on the country. There's no such thing as what we call a, a, a low energy rich country. Um, and what really drove our economy 56 from 50, 60 years ago was cheap and abundant electricity. So how? So we need to look at how gas is allocated between electricity, petrochemicals, and LNG to also ensure the sustainability of our country, where we remain competitive with regards to producing electricity on the on island. That is also very important for building other industries, especially in the manufacturing sector, all of which need power. So what I expect to see is greater power usage as we build out other parts of the sector to mitigate against the risk within the energy sector. We also need to look at energy conservation. We do waste energy. Um, that will also help with the power supply. Um, so those are the transmissions required, in my view. Some are legislative with regards to power, where they, they, they forgot if you call it TN Tech bill or the power bill. You know, what we should see is, as we have been talking for a while, everyone having solar panels on the roof, Finance that banks should be facilitating that as well. Um, so those are brief transformational things that I would expect to see. Now, in addition, way, okay. now, in addition to some of those that you mentioned, which you would like to see, of course, specifically focusing on transformation, what would you say your forecast or allocation would, list would look like for this budget 2024-2025? What other areas should we be focusing on? So, Everyone looks at the allocation to the monetary concerns, uh, monetary aspects, 
I, I have a different take. Um, you know, we spend six, seven billion on education, seven, eight billion on, on police, et cetera, et cetera. But what I'd like to see is strengthening of the institutional strengthening, right, of these organizations, right? Uh, we talk about, everyone talks about crime and so on, throwing more money, et cetera, that is not necessarily the answer, right? Uh, we have to strengthen these institutions with the right people um, um, and various aspects of, of, of dealing with this issue. The first one I'll look at will be education, how we, how we educate our kids, because the world is changing drastically, and the methods we used in the past, sorry to say, is not applicable for the future again. Um, so our entire education needs to be reformed, in my view. Does that need more cash? I don't think so. I think it just needs a, a redirecting of how it's done, a new curriculum, um, and, and, and some, in, some innovative ideas as to how to achieve that. Um, it's very easy to happen without spending too much more money, basically. Um, similarly, police service, if you observe what's happening, I read an article last night on Boston where crime, uh, actually murder has dropped to zero, and it just required more, more interaction with communities by police officers, NGOs, and so on, not putting more police officers on the street, but how we police, basically. Um, so there are different areas that, you know, we look at institutional strengthening and doing things differently than simply doing things in the past and throwing money at it. That's what I'd like to see. Understood. Let's take it back now to the energy sector and specifically the price of oil and gas. What do you think it would make sense to peg it at and how does that sit in relation to the forex situation in Trinidad and Tobago? Well, some bad news here. At the end of the day, the energy sector provides the majority of the FX and that's not going to change. Um, oil and gas prices are split. When you say oil, it's oil and natural gas. So it's two and two are very, very different um, pegs. So oil, you have WTI um, that you peg it towards, but it really depends on what type of oil you're producing and, and essentially the, 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 what the traders sell it at. Um, I mean, yeah, no, if you could forecast oil and gas, you'd be a very rich person. So I don't say what we're pegging at before is adequate for oil. Natural gas is a bit more complicated because you have, for us, three different commodities, LNG, methanol, and ammonia, uh, all of which are pegged to different mechanisms. So, for example, you know, if you sell LNG into, into Asia, you get $16. Into Europe, $10, right? Um, it varies, right? Um, so it really depends on where our cargoes go to um, and what's the, what, what are the underlying contracts. So I would say pricing, when you run an oil and gas company, something you have limited control over. What you do have control of is your cost and your competitors. So what we have to do is remain competitive in all areas of the oil and gas sector. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Yes, it does. Now, one of the things that you would have also just mentioned is institutional strengthening. How would you see that fitting into budget allocations, particularly within the energy sector and outside of the energy sector as well? So within the energy sector, um, I think the, the, the Ministry of Energy and the regulators are, are, are very well structured. So the, 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 the transformation I'm talking about is not doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. So a good example would be, as I said, with bunkering and trading. How do you create the barriers of barrier trading and so on? This world into large bunkering and trading um, companies, right? It, it requires probably different skill sets, um, different types of uh, individuals with different uh, view of the world to take that forward, right? Uh, with regards to creating, um, let's call it method of bunkering as well. You have the likes of Proman and Methanex. How do you partner with companies to actually have them bunker in Trinidad and Tobago alongside the barriers with the government and so on. What business model are you going to use to deliver that globally? Um, similar to ammonia, ammonia is a bit of a unique one um, because 90% of ammonia is, is used to produce uh, fertilizers. So how are we going to play in that game globally, right? Uh, that's where I'm talking about transmission. What we're doing now is good, but we're doing the same thing over and over again, right? Um, bed rounds, those type of things, which are all important, but those models are outdated, quite frankly. And, and they need to be actually be, be revamped to oh. take us forward to the next quarter, 50 years. This is, now, this is one thing that you have mentioned with the outdated models, and some will also bring up that same point as to they feel as though the same things are being reinvested in, the, the same wheel is being used. So some of the recommendations that you shared, we see that, that it could bring positive change into the next few decades. Um, in particular, is there any reason why we may have stuck to the same over the past few years? Is it because it has worked? Yeah, good question. Um, uh, how do I answer this correctly? Uh, it has worked, 
Um, what I will say is a lot of the folks who have done that are still there mm -hmm. um, and they've done a good job. But that whole way of thinking is, is you need to make way for fresh young blood who think differently, operate differently, who better understand the, the global issues. Um, so I think there needs to be a, a slight changing of the guard, if you want to put it nicely. Yeah. All right. right and on. Uh, we have very bright 30, 40 year olds coming in who actually are aggressive, um, think differently, know what they stand for. So I'll give you an example. So if you look at oil production or oil in Trinidad and Tobago, um, if you look at onshore oil in Forest Reserve, right, we've only produced 1.3 to 1.4 billion barrels of oil to date for the last 100 years in Forest Reserve, one area, right? What folks don't realize is the recovery rate or how much we've recovered from the ground is only about 12 to 14 percent. So there's another 85 percent of oil left in the ground because we need to go to 1.4 billion, meaning there's another 6 billion barrels of oil in the ground in Forest Reserve. How do we go after that? All right. Uh, those are the types of questions. And, and for that to happen, the commercial structure of, of uh, onshore um, lease operatorships far more need to be looked at. So there's huge potential, but we're using the same model, expecting the same results. Um, and that example I just gave you is very real, right? So, and that's one area that excludes Tridmar's acreage in the, um, in the Gulf of Paria and so on. So you have a lot of, for example, oil left. Is how do you access that? And we need a new commercial model. We need a new approach. We have very good local operators, for example, the brushes, well services, who are well poised to take advantage of those situations for the benefit of the country. And thank you so much for sharing that. So we're going to continue just, um, we have a bit more time left and I would love to touch on outside of the ecosystem, well, within the ecosystem, sorry, but outside of this specific ministry, is there anything that we can look to, for example, planning in terms of focusing on renewables and trade and industry, um, signing of MOUs that would be able to propel the industry forward and hopefully create new trends? Yeah, they... The manufacturing sector has actually been doing extremely well. Exports have been increasing under the Minister of Trade and the TTME, which is extremely encouraging and must be continued. As I articulated earlier, for manufacturing to, to, to increase the exports and to expand, a couple of things need to happen. One is we need to have more power going to the manufacturing sector. So that talks about gas allocation and how gas is allocated to power generation versus petrochemicals versus LNG. What I'd like to see is a dedicated supply for power generation that will guarantee uh, electricity supply for at least the next 20, 30 years. That will power the manufacturing sector because that's what actually drew manufacturers into Trinidad in the first place. So we need to maintain that competitive um, sector. Whether it be MOUs or just attracting investors, it's really powering that up. But to power that up, you need power generation. Yeah. And okay. now, You've mentioned the competitive edge. You've spoken about what we already have, which really positions us to be with the key advantage. As you said, I love the term you use, the gas station of the world, which is something we've heard many speak of, and we know that we can take full advantage of it once we implement and follow through with these plans. Let's speak about the future of energy, Mr. Pem Pemberton. Where do you see Trinidad and Tobago in the global space over the next few decades? That's a big gas station, quite frankly. We have, <laughs> we have actually exploited our majority of the resources on our island. We, re, we will be relying on, on, on natural gas from cross-border natural gas. There's a certain risk involved in that. But certainly with regards to, to the, the big gas station, the big trader bunkering there, manufacturing, securing a, a secure supply of gas for our power supply, and sort of empowering the private sector to be far more entrepreneurial, um, taking additional risk moving forward. So the energy sector will look very different. Um, for us to get to 4.5 BCF of gas, where we were 10 years ago, with supply from within our country, um, I think that's very challenging. Um, and that may change, right? So, so it will look very different in decades to come. But for us to be sustainable, I'd say it's a big gas station, um, powering up also uh, our manufacturing sector. Just a little point to note, Right. Uh, very interestingly, I mean, 55 percent of our gas production goes to LNG and LNG goes to power to generate to, to, to supply fuel to power other countries. Right. So as I said earlier, there's no such thing as a low as a rich, low energy country. So we are powering up other countries with their power generation. 
we need to look at that very, very critically from our perspective, because we do have the resources to power our country. And we need to be a bit more open-minded, whether it's, it's uh, data mining, whether it's, it's, it's manufacturing more suitcases, whatever the case is. That is key, because that's high employment, that keeps investors on the ground, and that keeps the money circulating internally. Definitely, we do need to keep an open mind. Mr. Pemberton, before we close this conversation, tell me, what are you looking forward to most in the budget reading today? I think more of a long-term plan to your last question is, is budgets tend to be look, look at things in a one-year horizon. Um, we need to look at things in a 20, 30-year horizon. So as I said, what would the energy sector look like in 20, 30 years, right? Whilst you push ahead to get cross-border gas, whilst you develop the, the deep water fields, it's not an and or situation, it's an and, right? So what is and? Let's, let's, let's go as fast as possible on the bunk ring. Let's go as fast as power regards to power generation. Um, let's make it an and conversation and not an or conversation. And then you'll see the benefits. It will be tough. It requires a different way of thinking, which change is always difficult. Uh, but we need to embrace that. And I always say diversity is not necessarily race and religion, which is where everybody focuses on. It's diversity of thought, right? And we can't have the same folks Everyone in the room can't be thinking the same. We have to embrace diversity of thought and be challenged to take us forward. Yes. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Pemberton. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. You too. It's a pleasure.